Hey, it's Bridget. I'm heading over. I'm heading over. Like my new chair. Welcome to Above Life Channel. The purpose here is to inspire your spirit and to fill you with hope. It's a little weird. I feel kind of far away from you. <laughs> it's always so strange when I feel like you guys are like looking at my whole body. I don't know why that is. It's just weird. A little weird. So let's get into our session today. We're going to have a conversation with George Michael in the afterlife. I've actually been thinking about talking to George for a while now and uh, haven't actually done it. I wanted to talk to him about some a couple of different things and I just wanted to reconnect. It's been so long and he's such a sweet, 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 sweet soul that talking to him is really good. So, oh, you guys, I tweaked my back a little bit, but it was worth it. Let's be clear. I traveled and, you know, those little airplane seats and stuff and I have kind of long legs and stuff and trying to stretch myself out and twist on a flight coming back. Uh, home, I just, I think I did something to it. So anyway, I'm getting better. I went to the chiropractor, so I'm going to be better. So I keep looking at what, I, I need to grab something to drink. It's a little too far away here. So I haven't talked to George in a while. It's been a while. I usually talk to him around Christmas time because that's the time he made his transition. But I want, I just, I miss him. I kind of miss him. He feels like a good, gosh, I really want to cross my legs and I just can't do it. So, um, my chair rocks. Hopefully that doesn't annoy you. George, can you come in so that they can feel your energy? That'd be great. It's so weird to call him George. It never fits for me to call him George. It just doesn't. Um, but can you come in, my dear? Oh, so sweet. Very red. Lots of red. A bit Freddie Mercury. Like, I feel, I definitely feel a little bit of a kinship between George Michael and Freddie Mercury. And I think it's because of the the tribute that you sang to him was really, really good. He says, oh, thank you. He's like, oh, thank you, thank you. You are just the kindest, compassionate, energetic spirit. When I feel you, I feel just this beautiful, soft, tender, empathic soul. Can you talk to us a little bit about being an empath and what it means to be compassionate? Literally to feel everything, quite frankly. Can you talk to us about that? There's so many of us that are just struggling so much with our feelings today and I would love to get some insight from you, my dear friend. He, it's like he wants to kiss me on the cheek and say, it's so nice to see you, that's really beautiful. And I feel like we need to have mimosas for some reason. I'm not sure what the orange, orange juice and champagne is. It's, it's afternoon, so I don't know what that's about, but that's really sweet. And the sun just starts coming out as soon as I'm connecting with you, of course, so sweet. Talk to us about feeling so much. Help us understand this. It's really, I just can feel my heart. Can you guys feel your heart and feel the deep presence of, of George Michael holding our hearts very tender and compassionately. So the red, he says, the red is actually with a purpose, Bridget. The red is for a purpose. It's to remind you of the, he says, the fury, the fury. That's the best match energetically for what, because because I feel him, you guys. I don't hear him clairaudiently word for word, but I feel his energy of information. That's why I'm getting the messages. And I, I hear parts of his conversation with me. He says the red is part of the fury. And, and it feels like frustration with being overloaded and, and stretched and pulled in so many directions. And there's so many people want so much from you. And he says, I know what that feels like. George Michael knows what that feels like. You can't be what everyone needs you to be. And he says, and that is devastating. When you realize that, when you finally realize that you can't be everything to all the people that want you and need you to be a certain way, he says, and you can't, you just can't be that because it would require yourself to break yourself up in so many chunks and pieces that you wouldn't really know who you are or recognize yourself. He says, you, you can't be all things to all people. You can't do that and, and still have your sanity, still have your heart. He says, the hearts are not meant to be broken apart so much. They can be shattered and devastated. He says, there's so much healing that occurs in a human existence, in, in relationship. 
And he says, I've always wanted to have love, to have a home, uh, someone to share my life with, he says. And the image of that, the vision of that could never be It never, I never felt that it could actually be mine. That's really sad. Isn't it? He says, isn't it? I didn't realize until many, many years later that all the people who loved me, my family, he says, my sister, my mother, all they wanted for me was to really, truly be happy, to be loved, and in a loving, relationship and to have a life that was filled with love. I never quite thought that that was possible for me. And there is a sadness about that. He says there's a sadness about that. She said, do you have regrets? He says, it was, it's a different time. It was a different time. It wasn't love was clearly defined and now it's much more open and free freedom he says so much freedom and he's saying i would take advantage of that if i could i would would you live so would you live openly gay and maybe be married and yeah, he says oh this is really sad this is hitting my heart yeah he says yeah Yes, to have children, to have a family, to have someone to grow old with. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes I would, yes. It may not have been possible for me, he says, in the times that we were, I mean, I grew up during those times as well, and my father was gay, as you well know, we've talked about that before, and, he lived a life where he was married and had three children and wasn't able to fully live expressed and as himself and um, tragic to me. And something I said I would never, I personally, you guys, I said that I would never <clears throat> allow myself to live halfway or to live unfulfilled you know whatever that looks like at any stage of our lives because it changes right as we get older it changes you know and life changes we change we grow we evolve we learn oh gosh hopefully we learn right so love expanded as an empath, when we have a lot of relationships where we are bound to others and in expectation and a structure or scaffolding that has brought us some security in the past of knowing what to do, exactly how to do it so that the other person will appreciate, recognize and accept us. How do we change within that structure or do we have to destroy it? Does it have to die? Oh, he says, oh, it's the people that grow and change and evolve. The structures mean nothing. He says, they, they mean nothing. The rules mean nothing. They mean nothing. Look at the image, he says. Look at the image of me as a, as a pop star that um, would be appealing or attractive to hundreds of teenage girls, right? Thousands of teenage girls. That's the image, right? That's the image, and it's, it's not real. And now it wouldn't need to be presented in that way in order to attract the opportunities to grow and change and evolve and create more news, mu more music, to travel, to, to have more opportunities, to write more songs, to have all these shows and entertainment venues and experiences in it. And it's not the structure the set of rules. It's not the rigid protocols you follow.
that's who you are inside. And do the people around you either grow with you or they go? It's hard to believe that, especially if it's family, but it's, remind, I'm reminded of something that my dad and I, we had an exchange before he died. And George, you know this because we've talked about it a bit that it was my way of forgiving my dad. And not that he needed my forgiveness, but I, I, I look back and I know that I was angry for him choosing to keep a secret and not trust us, me, with that, knowing that it would kill him. He chose to die instead of being himself. Who would do that? Who would choose death over being yourself? Because you're afraid that who you are disappoints others? Like that doesn't even, I can't even imagine. So what? So what? Is it about a fear of rejection or not being loved? It's not being worthy? What is it? I don't, I don't understand this. I mean, he says there's a great deal of fear when it comes to change. And when you've built a life that's stable or seems stable, steady, it's difficult for change to come through like a tornado. He's like, like a big storm, like lots of wind. It's hard for that, you know, it's hard for that to happen. And instead people hold on to false beliefs about themselves and others and expectations are unrealistic. And it might just be that those other people that you're in relationship with have those same kinds of feelings too. This is deep, George, this is deep. He says, Bridget, you wanted to talk about empaths and about being compassionate. And the most important thing to understand is to understand you're not gonna know all the answers. People are not gonna behave and respond the way you expect them to. So many people have changed over the course of the past few years. Everything is new and different. And because of that, there is instability and fear and this need to hang on tighter and tighter and tighter. Well, when you hang on to something so tight, you crush it, you destroy it. Okay, George, you are so sweet and kind and caring and feeling you with this fury, like you said, the red is like fury. It is different. It's really different to feel you that way. It's like a passion for, it's like this understanding of the value of life is to be alive, fully alive and realized. And not everyone will achieve that in their lifetime and not everyone wants to because they forget. They forget that life is about feeling, about the senses, about the experiences of just the simple, the simplest, most beautiful things, but you need to be able to share that with someone because it makes it so much better. He says, that's what life is, shared experiences. George, you're so deep today. You're kind of romantic too, I gotta say. I'm kind of feeling romantic vibes. Are you guys feeling that with George Michael? I'm kind of feeling romantic vibes with you, George. I got my heart necklace on today, my black and white heart necklace, kind of a balancing energy of not knowing the answers, not knowing the right way, the right path, the right thing to do next, but knowing that the universe is here to support us and knowing that faith, is a key ingredient in, to, in, in success and happiness. And that is in my life, in your life, in your life, in relationships. Speaking of life, can you talk to me a little bit about the twin flame thing? Because I'm curious about this. Because soulmates and twin flames, different vibes. Soulmates, after all, let's recap, okay? Let's recap. Oh, you guys, I have to bend a little bit. Ugh. Oh my goodness. All right, gotta stop doing those gymnastics. Those back handsprings are, are killing me. <laughs> Just kidding. Seriously, it's not that exciting. I literally was sitting on an airplane for way too long in a weird position. You know how that is. You know how that is, right? So, so I'll deal with it. 
So talk to me about so so twin so so soulmates are I can't I cannot even I just can't do this. Okay, there we go. This is gonna be the most awkward video with me repositioning myself every 20 seconds, but whatever. You guys love me, right? You can handle it. So soulmates, because we've had multiple lifetimes, I'm just gonna explain this to them, okay? If I'm wrong or inaccurate or if you have something to add, please add it. Soulmates are when You've had multiple lifetimes. You've been reincarnated many times. Therefore, you've been a soul in many bodies, many types, many varieties, all that kind of stuff. A lot. And so say you've done it 30 times, which you've probably done it more like 80. Let's be clear. Probably that's a little more the case. And say you've done it 30 times, 80 times, whatever. Every time, likely, you have at least one mate, right? Your soul finds a mate and there's a person. Maybe it's not a lover or a husband or a wife or a mother or a sister or a best friend. It, it could be anybody. It could be a best friend. It could be anybody. That just you connect with, you jive with, you know you trust no matter what, like your ride or die vibe. And someone that knows you, that loves you no matter what, right? It doesn't have to be romantic. It can be friendship. It can be that kind of thing or sibling, etc. And yet, twin flame is different. Totally different ball game. The symbol of that is a swan, and it's been coming really strong to me. Where twin flame is this? I thought it was once in a lifetime. I don't think it's once in a lifetime. I think it's a reoccurring connection or meetup between lifetimes, not just in a lifetime. So it transcends lifetimes. Therefore, because time is layered and not linear, you can experience twin flames in multiple capacities in different various ways at different times and points in your life when you need that awareness or recognition. So my question to you is twin flame, is it someone that, is it a person and someone that reincarnates with you and how is it different than soulmates? Do you know this? He says, as an empath, this is something that can be very off-putting. He says it can really throw you full of, for a loop, he says. It's the kind of like dizzy love that you only hear about in books, you know? Or you see in a music video, you know? And how can that even possibly last? How can that kind of uh, last? And he says, it's because there's no time with it. There's no, the twin flame is no concept of time. It's the literally, the quite literally the other half of you. It's like a winged creature with two wings that can only fly with both of them. When one is not there, it cannot fly. It does not have its fullest capacity. And it feels like there's constantly one missing. Something is constantly missing, and so there's a need to seek, need to look for that other, that other part or piece. But it's not to say that you're not full or can't live a life that is full, because many people do and they experience encounters with multiple different soulmates in their lifetimes, and that's quite contented. It depends on your path and your purpose and what is needed during this time to unfold. But it's more, he says, the in between the lifetimes is when the unification and the bond is strengthened so that when you come into a life, if there is this sense of feeling of missing or something not being right or something being wrong or always kind of off, it's because of the lack of the other wing, thus the twin flame, thus the two as one part of the same bird, the same whole. That's the best way to describe it. That is beautiful. So it feels like it's not often. It, it really, he says, there's really no determination or calculation based upon how often that happens for someone in a lifetime or it, how often it happens for people. He says it's not exclusionary. It doesn't, it doesn't, um, it, there's not this like finite amount of twin flame experiences or twin flames, he says. But it's definitely a pathway that is not easy to walk. It is difficult. The twin flame is the, it's almost as though like the twins, like, you know how you, um, he's showing me like how twins when they're born, like they, if they feel each other's feelings, they feel they have like very similar mannerisms and gestures. They don't just look the same, but they feel the same. And he says, it's sort of like that. It's like this, but it's not bio biological. It's this metaphysical, universal, like this um, very undeniable cosmic draw. It's like this cosmic, 
um, magnification, magnetic, con cosmic kind of s clicking in. And he says, I can tell you that when twin flames do come together in a lifetime, that it is something that is, it's unbelievable. And it's not easy. And it's not, um, it's so powerful that it cannot be handled by many people. And so there aren't a lot of that, those experiences. You, you, you don't see a lot of that. So how do you know so much about this? As an empath, he says, empath, empathic heart. And you asked, you asked about the compassion and the most important thing to know when, when you're dealing with soulmates or twin flames in particular is that you've got to be fiercely compassionate with yourself and also any other soul that you might come in contact with because they might be misguided or not really understand the, the fullness of the concept or the experience of either one of those things and you have to be uh, rather patient or understanding in order to be able to recognize that part at least that portion for yourself he says that participation for yourself well what makes it so special and unique is when the two become the one that's what is unusual perhaps so wow that's deep so we talked about being an empath, we talked about compassion, we talked about soulmates, we talked about twin flames. Those are great concepts. Thank you so much, George Michael, for being here and having conversation with us today. I appreciate it very much. Thank you for watching here on Above Life channel. This has been an interesting channeling video. We'll see. <laughs> we'll have to watch it back and see if I look like too much of a dork and I don't want to sh share it. Hmm. I hope that we've inspired your spirit today and filled you with some hope, gave you some interesting things to think about, to feel about, very empathic, very heart-based, heart-intuitive today. And I hope that we've encouraged you to live your life. It's your life after all, and you get to live it. So just live it. Thanks for being here.